Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Purpose Driven Live Sports, and I'm back here for another sports video. Now, I just watched the two first games of today's NBA playoffs, and there's actually the Pistons and Bucks game going on right now. That game is in Detroit, and that game is in the middle of the first quarter. But I want to talk about the Philadelphia Sixers game first, and also want to talk about the Denver Nuggets and Spurs game. So, Philadelphia versus the Brooklyn Nets. So, Philadelphia is officially up 3-1, and they go back home, and they can officially close the series out in Philadelphia in Game 5. That game was actually going in the Brooklyn Nets' favor at first. Joel Embiid did play this game, and he dominated completely. He had 31 points, 16 rebounds, 5 assists. I believe he also had 6 blocks, so he was pretty dominant on both ends of the floor. The Philadelphia 76ers, once again, out-rebounded the Nets, who are a much smaller team. And they're a team that doesn't really have a lot of big guys, a lot of strong guys who rebound the ball. They were out-rebounded at 55-42, to and they still only lost by four points. It was 112-108. This game got very chippy from the beginning, and it stayed that way until Jared Dudley and Jimmy Butler got ejected for the little scrum in the third quarter with Joel Embiid, who fouled Jared Allen. And what Jared what Jared Dudley did was he kind of set a message to the whole Sixers team that when they laughed in that press conference, he wasn't the whole team was not really happy about it. And to me, he kind of sent a message as in maturity is really is it's it's gonna make you or break you in the NBA. And for Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons to be laughing at a press conference about you could have nearly injured somebody when you elbowed somebody in the face a couple days ago. Jared Dudley didn't let that go. Ben Simmons and Jared Dudley have been going at it. He's been guarding him. He only held him to six points. And I think Jared Dudley's being a pest because he's not really a really skilled guy. So what his job is as a veteran is to kind of just make scrappy plays, kind of annoy guys because of his limited skill set in, in the plays. But I'm actually really impressed with the Nets, even though they lost this game. They had this game in the bag to me, but... They just rebounding is is a huge part when you can't grab defensive rebounds and and then Philadelphia getting those second chances and then hitting three pointers you're leaving guys open. JJ Redick was the first guy who actually hit the hit the go ahead three. The Nets came back and hit a go ahead shot also, and then in the corner Mike Scott hit the hit the game winning three basically. Then they got in the foul situation and then uh, Tobias Harris sealed the game with two free throws so. This was a game that easily the the Nets could have won had they really just made their free throws also and if they rebounded well. Boxing out is a huge key in the playoffs too because you got to be able to get bodies on the glass. You got to be able to get your hands on the ball. And it's just Joel Embiid is injured, but he's he's really skilled. He's strong, and there's not guys who can guard him one-on-one. -on -one. So... This Philadelphia series, it's not it's not a surprising series. It's one that you would that you expect to go like this, but it's also one that you're surprised that the Nets are actually this close in games with a team that's as talented as Philadelphia. So I'm gonna just say that while I'm not surprised because I expect Philadelphia to actually win the series and they might win in five, I'm I'm actually impressed with Brooklyn because they're actually showing composure as a young team with a lot of guys who haven't even been there before. So that part's actually impressive. Then Denver came into San Antonio in this next game down 2-1, tied the series 2-2, won 117-103. I'm really impressed with Jamal Murray because he came out aggressive and he hit his first shot of the game. I believe he hit nine field goals in total. He was just aggressive from the onset, making shots, making a lot of threes. He was also getting involved in playmaking. Now, because he's a young guy, a lot of young guys in this league aren't two-way players yet. They're guys who either score or guys who can defend. They're not they're not much young two-way players. But that happens as they develop and get older, you know, get more experience in the league. But his calling card right now is he's a guy who can just flat-out score and can just flat-out shoot the ball. And he's just really handling that, and he's just doing his job. He's doing a great job at it. Nikola Jokic, he had 27 points. I believe he had... 12 rebounds and 8 assists so for the last two games he's played exceptionally well he's played exceptionally well this whole series just being able to be a playmaker and get guys the ball that's helped them and because he's a great rebounder also his his impact on the team is just so ast is, is astronomical and to me he while Jamal Murray's the guy who really scores and he's a guy who kind of provides that energy spark 
the whole thing is really predicated on Nikola Jokic just playing his game and getting guys involved. That's what I'm impressed with. Now, I haven't really watched much of the Pistons game. I'll, I'll catch up on that. But I, last time I saw the uh, the Bucks were up 24-22. Blake Griffin is playing in this game. I don't think that's going to be much of a difference, even though he's a great playmaker and he's a guy who can stretch the floor for the Pistons. I still expect the Bucks to win this game, still by at least 10 points. I think I think the Bucks just have so much. They're so overwhelmingly talented than the Pistons that, to me, Blake Griffin doesn't make a huge difference. Not even in rebounding, not in scoring. I, I still think in that match between him and Giannis Antetokounmpo, Giannis will dominate because Giannis is so athletically gifted. He's expanding his range. He's actually making guys come away from the basket with the mid-range shots and the three-point shots, even though he's not really an outside shooter. And his his defensive prowess, his, his locking down the paint and locking down the perimeter has really helped this team actually get leads also. So Giannis Antetokounmpo is the complete package. That's what I'm telling you right now. And for the final matchup of tonight, a game that I, I'm really excited to see is, again, the Houston Rockets versus the Utah Jazz. Utah Jazz are at home in this game. So, I was reading something on ESPN earlier from Zach Lowe, and James Harden has come a long way in scoring. And he talked about the game six against San Antonio Spurs back in 2017 when he uh, went 2 for 11, only had, I believe, 13 points because, of course, he scored a lot of his points from the free of the line as well. Had six turnovers, fouled out. He talked about how his floater has really changed how teams guard him and this gimmick defense that's now being played on James Harden that the Utah Jazz have adapted and they're using, which is where you really play hard on his left shoulder and you force him to go right, and hopefully you force him to either make a, turn it over, shoot a floater, which you're willing to live with, and not foul him. I don't... I don't like this defensive strategy because it kind of in it it involves a lot of the the paint protector the center having to come up out of the paint and having to contest a lot of shots and then the guy who Clint Capella is always sitting at the edge of the block always waiting for a lob or waiting for a dump down pass a bounce pass to dunk it again and James Harden the, their offense in Houston is so it's simple but it's so it's so weird how they run it man because they always have two guys on either side around the corners who who can shoot threes. So you never know with these rotations how it's going to affect how you're contesting shots. And when you watch these and when you watch a lot of clips of the Utah Jazz contesting shots and getting out and making rotations, they're so late because a lot of times the guy who's supposed to be helping up on James Harden is late, then the guy has to come out late and contest shots and it's already over after that. I think what needs to happen is if you're going to force him to go right, I think you got to be physical and you got to get up in his body, but not you, what people make a make, make a mistake of. Excuse me, is reaching a lot of times because he exposes the ball, so you reach. If you're if you're putting your hands back, but you're basically being physical and putting your chest into his left shoulder, I think you're gonna physically wear James Harden down. That's going to really bode well for the Utah Jazz in this series. If you're physically wearing him down and you're making him make contested shots, I'd rather him take a step back three, even though he's making that at 40% this year, than him really getting into the lane and taking a straight line drive and getting points in the paint easily. Because what he, what the Jazz are doing is a great job of not fouling him and getting him to the free throw line, but they're giving him straight line drives. And that's while they're stepping up and contesting layups, Colonel Capella has an easy time of getting bounce passes, and also their rotations are slow. And that gives him so many decisions that he can make as a ball handler. So if you're if you're really being physical and you're really bumping him and you're putting your chest into his left shoulder and you're cutting him off at certain points to make him either take a tested step back mid-range or three-point shots, to me... Those contest those contested shots are more far more better than him taking a contested layup, a contested floater, or Clint Capella getting an easy bounce pass for a dunk, or somebody else getting open in the corner because your rotations are too slow. And then I've talked about this before, and it's something that really annoys me that teams don't do a lot is if you're gonna 
not only do they have to physically wear him down on the defensive end on offense, they're going to have to do a lot of pick and roll with James Harden, his guy, you know, screening for the guy on Donovan Mitchell or somebody on Ricky Rubio and just going at him and making him play defense on the perimeter. That's going to – that can really extend the series. If James Harden starts getting worn down and he starts getting tired, you've seen in the playoffs that when James Harden is tired and he's fatigued, he starts missing a lot of shots. His shots are short or they're long. And mentally that wears on a, on a guy like James Harden. And then he's not – he's kind of complaining about calls that he isn't getting. He starts – a lot of what I see James Harden do is he flops on three-point shots where he kicks his legs out, and I don't like it when refs give him, give him that call. To me, that's a little suspect. But you know, I'm not a ref, so I'm not gonna. I'm not in a position to make that call. But I'm just saying, when I watch James Harden, I see that a lot. So, two things you have to do for Utah: you have to wear him down on the defensive end. Like I said, if you're gonna make him go right, you better force him to go right, and I mean force him physically, not reaching. But you got to ride that shoulder physically and make him take step back shots since he loves that shot so much. And then defensively, to me, Donovan Mitchell will have a better time attacking James Harden off the dribble and getting into the lane than trying to do a whole bunch of other stuff that he's trying to do, which is drive off the other, I mean, drive off of other guys, trying to take contested layups over Clint Capella. To me, that's not working so well. So if they can change that, I think they can kind of turn this around. So. Last last game I did pick Utah. I think I'll pick Utah again because they're at home and they got the home court advantage. So I say Utah wins this game, but this game is going to be very close because to me Houston has a lot of firepower still and guys guys like PJ Tucker are shooting well. Eric Gordon's actually having a good series, even though Chris Paul's been a little quiet. You never know with him because of his he doesn't need to shoot threes. He can get into the lane. He can take mid range shots. He's a great passer still. So. But I'm still going to take the Utah Jazz to win this game. I've also got the Bucks, like I said, winning the game tonight. And we already talked about those other games earlier. So thank you guys for listening. And I'll be talking to you guys again in the next video.